Thank you all for leading us into a spirit of worship with that. Friends, it is so good to be together. Those that are gathered here, and if you are joining us online, welcome to you. We enter into this third Sunday of Advent where we light the candle of joy. And I don't know if that is the spirit that you walked into the room with this morning or not, but we're going to do our best to get you there by the end. Amen? There are many things going on in the life of the church. Um, before we get into that, into the news, I just want to welcome you if you are visiting with us for one of the, the first time or one of the first times, I'll draw your attention that there are these connect cards in the pew pockets in front of you. And that's a place where you can fill out your contact information so we can reach out to you in the week ahead and see if you have any questions and just thank you for being with us. You can fill that out and turn that in to any one of our host team members. They'll be happy to take that from you. There's also a place for prayer requests on the back of that card and I just want to encourage anyone and everyone in the room that is one of the the best things that we can do with and for each other is to to be in prayer about what God has put on our hearts so if you have a prayer request you'd like to share with us you can also turn that in to any member of the host team and they will get it back to to the prayer team as well um, this week, uh, this, this evening we have services, and then of course next week as we welcome Christmas, there are services all day on Christmas Eve and lots going on. So let's take a look at the news for more details on that. As much as the holidays are a time of laughter and joy and noise and time with friends and family, we also have to acknowledge that the things that cause us stress and grief in life do not take the season off. Tonight, we have carved out a special time for a lower key, more contemplative time of worship at 5 p.m. in the Jones Road Sanctuary. It's our silent night service, a service of hope and healing, a time when we can come to the altar with our grief, whether that be over the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship, the loss of a job, or, or simply just distress, over the circumstances of life and the world around us. Lay those things at the altar and worship together in the name of the one true hope that has come for us, whether it is a time of joy or sorrow. We hope that you'll join us. We hope you will worship with us on Christmas Eve. If you're gonna be out of town, we have a special Christmas candlelight service happening on Thursday, December 21st at 7 p.m. at our Fry Road campus. Our Traveler's Christmas service will be a chance for us to worship together before you hit the road. And for December 24th, here at Jones Road, we will have three services in the Sanctuary and two in Foundry Hall. The Sanctuary times will be 9.15, 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Foundry Hall services will be at 10.45 and 4 p.m. All services will be candlelight services, so make plans to worship and celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ together. All of our service times are posted on our website at foundrychurch.org. Merry Christmas. Hey everybody, Jeremiah and Chris here from the FSM team. We are super excited to announce that registration for the high school retreat is now open. That's right, so make sure you guys save the dates for January 26th to 28th. We're taking all of our high schoolers to Frontier Camp. It's gonna be a great time. Make sure you sign up now because spots are limited. Guys, this is an amazing time for you to disconnect from the world around you and build in a rhythm of rest. We have so much good happening at FSM. We want to make sure we capitalize on that and really lean into God and our relationship with Him and our relationship with each other. I love that. And so make sure you go to foundrychurch.org slash students to register, and we are so excited for high school retreat. you to join us for a celebration concert on January 19th featuring the worship group Leland. Invite friends and family to celebrate with us through music, prayer, and more. Concert begins at 7 p.m. with the doors opening at 5.30 for a pre-concert reception. This event will take place at the new CFISD Visual and Performing Arts Center. Tickets go on sale December 19th and all proceeds will benefit our mission partner, Compassion International. Find all details at foundrychurch.org slash concert. Can't wait to see you there.
So if you can see past Christmas, those are two great events happening in January, is the moral there, right? FSM and then that great concert. Um, for Christmas Eve, I'll just point out, we did hand these out on the way in, and so if you need a little help remindering, uh, grab one of these, um, hand it to a neighbor or a friend that maybe needs a place to worship on Christmas Eve. We'd love to have them join us as well. As we continue in the spirit of worship, would you stand now with me? We turn to these words from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the way. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. He is the truth. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. He is the life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence this morning. And I don't know the circumstances, God, that have brought your children together in this place, but I know that you have given us this moment and this time to see you to have your spirit draw near, to hear you, to experience the way and the truth and the life that comes for your people only from you. God, meet us in this place. Move in us and for us and around us today. Let every word that is spoken, every note that is sung, be, Lord, one to glorify you and to bring us closer to who you are. In Jesus' most mighty name we pray, amen. amen. Let us continue to worship as we sing together. turn to the Advent candle now on this third Sunday of this season. These candles are a tradition that remind us that Christ has come as our hope, our peace, and today reminds us that Christ has come as our source of joy. And it is my joy to have Lillian here from our confirmation class to lead us in our reading. A reading from Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim this, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. The mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. Thank, thank you, Lillian. Today we light the candle of joy because of what Christ has done for us. 
We know that we have joy in our Savior despite our circumstances. And so would you sing with us as we rejoice that Christ is the source of our joy. around here as we prepare for all of our Christmas celebrations this week. And I just want to thank you for the ways that you are giving, that you are sharing the good news of Jesus and helping us help people know, follow, and share Jesus. Um, it's a great time of year to do that. And each week during worship, we pause just to give thanks to God, to worship Him through our giving. And we want to do that today. I want to just remind you that we rely on year in giving uh, for a big percentage of our budget. And so if you've been thinking about that and praying about that, I hope you will give as the Lord has blessed you as we close out this year and as we continue to do his work. Um, I'm praying for just a great week of his light to shine and for his good news to be proclaimed across both of our campuses. And I'm so thankful for you and the ways that you partner with us to make sure that happens. Let's pray. God, thank you for your son, for your light for your goodness um, that is with us. And as we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us this week, we pray you to fill our hearts with peace, with joy, with hope for the future. Uh, God, we pray that your love would flow through us, that we would share the good news of Jesus with this world. It's in his name that we pray.
Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Today from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, with what joy we gather in your name. You have given us this time and this place. You have given us this fellowship of believers to worship together with. You have given us beautiful music to lift up to you. You have given us candlelight and spirit and presence. Lord, all of this pair just pales in comparison to the life and the glory that awaits each one of us in you. Lord, I know that there are so many things going on in our lives. There are moments of great celebration as we welcome in new life and new milestones. There are moments of great sorrow as we say goodbye to loved ones, to jobs and circumstances and homes and relationships. There are places where healing is needed, physical healing. There are places, Lord, where we need your peace desperately to intercede in our minds and our hearts and our emotions. Lord, over all of these things, you speak life. You speak it abundantly. And you have spoken it from the beginning. As we gather and we continue to worship and we, and we lift up your word and we pray and meditate over your word this morning, I pray, God, that you would open eyes and hearts and minds to see that life in a new way. That is not just something that we sing about at this season. It's not just something that we, that, that we go through the motions for because it's Christmas time. But Lord, it is, it is what you have come to live and die for, for us. Life. And life abundant. God, we are listening. Would you speak to us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Morning. Good morning. Can you believe that Christmas is eight days away? <laughs> eight days. Everybody get your shopping done? Yes, yeah, so there's some no's in the house. Yeah, um, good luck with that. It's the best week to go shopping because the crowds are pretty low. You can get in and out so fast everywhere. It's awesome. But seriously, who's really excited for Christmas? All right, so we got one person up here that's really excited for Christmas. I, I ran into someone. Um, we have someone stepping in to do sound, and I think this is about to pop. So I, it's, real, it's a little hot up here, Kevin. Mike's a little hot. Sorry, bud. Um, 
Just give Kevin a hand. He's stepping in as a volunteer. Yeah, I'm serious. This is huge. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But I ran into someone this week, and this person said to me, I think they're in the building, and said, I can't wait for Christmas, and I can't wait for it to leave. Um, I think some of us are super excited for Christmas. Others just want to simply get through it. Um, I can recall a time um, in my life, and I'm sure you can too, when you were waiting for something to happen, for something, you were anticipating something, and something good, and not, sometimes we wait for things that are really bad, or things we dread and worry about. We make ourselves sick, and we feel sick, and we get ulcers and all that stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the good stuff. When you've been away from a loved one and you know they're flying in and you're excited, especially back in the day when you could wait at the gate, you were so excited. Every person walked in, you would see it. I remember as a kid, whenever I'd invite a friend over, I'd just sit at the window like a dog, thinking that it, somehow they would arrive faster or the pizza came, I would be outside <laughs> waiting because if I made contact with the vehicle that had the Pizza Hut sign on top or Domino's, then I knew it would arrive faster to where I was. You know, it's scientifically proven. If you make eye contact with whatever you're waiting for, it arrives faster. It is. I think nowadays we've been somewhat um, conditioned to the different alerts on our phones. Or when something is arriving, I know my daughter, when she orders something, she's sitting there looking at her phone of where the truck is on Amazon and where it is. She's like three stops away. That could be three hours. Like, you have no idea what those stops mean, but just this idea that it's almost here. I think there's something within us that we live with that uh, inside of us, waiting for something to happen that is good. And, and this is particularly true in the Christmas season, which, by the way, the Christmas season it is really, by the church calendar, referred to as Advent. Christmas is a day, and the whole season is Advent. And the word Advent means the coming or arrival. And during Jesus' time, this idea of something that was coming or arriving was associated with the appearance of a king, of a powerful ruler. And the people were anticipating a king, someone who delivered them, someone that would bring justice and peace to the world. And this season, we remember the one who rules everything that is and everything that is to come. That is Jesus Christ. And in many ways, what we do during the season in preparation for Christmas of Advent is what Dr. Pascarello calls remembering the future. It's, it's these, this, these concepts that seem to, to dance with one another of something that has happened and yet something that in many ways is still to come. I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. He says, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect and who look forward to something greater to come. Now, if that's true, I wonder for us, what are we looking forward to? Are we looking forward to anything? Not just in this season, but in life. What are you looking forward to? See, the people of Israel back in the day were looking forward to God arriving on the scene. They had prophecies and signs, and yet God showed up in the flesh. And then when he did, they seemed surprised, and some of them missed it altogether. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And here's the deal. What the Old Testament wrote about, the prophecy, the prophesying of a child coming to be with us, has truly and factually happened in Christ Jesus. A baby, the son of a carpenter, born of a virgin Mary, he has visibly and tangibly arrived on the scene. And though it was foretold, some were looking forward to it. They missed it. They missed his arrival. You know, we could go through this season very easily and miss his arrival. At the same time, we read in the New Testament the establishment of Jesus' kingdom. And yet we also read that the 
fulfillment of this kingdom and the restoration, the full restoration of things are still to come. That's why for us in this time of Advent, as I mentioned last week, we're in between two Advents. It's a time of waiting. It's a time of patience. And yet, a time of hope. Not only waiting to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on Christmas Day, but we also wait for Christ's second arrival, his final coming in all glory and all power. And this is where his victory over evil will be completely realized and his kingdom fully and forever established. See, Advent allows us a time to remember, a time to celebrate, a time to anticipate the arrival of God in our very lives here and now, regardless of how crazy, how dysfunctional, how painful, how dark, or even quote-unquote perfect our lives may be, God wants to arrive in our lives. The question is, will you and I let him arrive in our lives? Because God has a way that only he can of drawing near to us. We even sang about it in one of our first hymns today. And God chooses to draw near to us. And we, many of us, I believe all of us, in some fashion long for that. But yet when he seems to arrive many times, if we're honest, he is unwelcomed and unexpected for us. We long for it, but he shows up. We're like, man, why is he interrupting my life? I kind of had things going my way. All I need you to do is bless it. All I need you to do is remove the obstacle so I can be happy and enjoy everything else. And I, I think we're, we're, we're getting things mixed up sometimes. That his arrival isn't just simply so he can just be with us and be like, hey, what's up? I'll be down here if you need me. It's an invitation to a different way of being present in this life. And we have a God that likes to draw near to us. And we see this from the very beginning of time of God in his creation, being near to his creation. He is walking and talking with his creation in the garden. The very presence of God dwelled in the garden with Adam and Eve. And in the garden, he gives Adam and Eve very specific commands of what they are to do. And there are two specific words that are used in the Hebrew. We translated predominantly, depending on the English version that we use, to cultivate and keep. What's interesting is these are the same words later given to priests to describe their responsibilities in the temple. In essence, our role from the beginning was priestly in nature. Even after the breaking of shalom, sin entering into our very nature, into this world, into humanity, God doesn't run away and hide from his creation. It's a matter of fact, even more he pushes in. Yeah, there are consequences but it's not this infantile God that's so ticked off that turns his back to us because we've sinned. And I know there, there's this thinking, this line of thinking that we've grown up, especially in this culture, that you gotta get right with God. And we've heard this line before. That it's up to us to get right with God. Well, if the reality is if I could get right with God, then I don't need God. But it's because I am not right with God that I long, I foresee God drawing near to me because I can't because of my sin, because of my brokenness, because of my limitations, because of who I am. I can't draw near to God on my own. It's his doing, it's his work. And we see that from the beginning. God constantly coming toward his creation and saying, I love you, I got you, I am holy, I need to separate, but I'm gonna create a way for us to be together. And he drew near to Adam and Eve in their fear, in their shame, in their sin. And there's similarities between creation, the garden, and the temple that we've been talking about, or the tabernacle, and they're astounding. We won't get into them this, all into this morning. We don't have time. But they are the symbol, an image of God's dwelling in the midst of humanity. Everything culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, after the fall and moving from the garden, God is still pursuing us. All throughout scripture, we see God revealing himself, his power, his provision, his purpose for his people. And he does this in a variety of ways. 
the people kept anticipating God to return, to dwell with them in some fashion. But they weren't exactly sure how this was going to take place. But God kept revealing himself and his plan. And after he forms his people, Israel, scripture says they were, a peop- they were not a people, and he makes them into a people. He says those who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. He begins to shape them into his likeness. He establishes a rhythm how they're to be present with him. And he gives the people of Israel the law. Then he gives them prophets and judges and kings and priests, all pointing ultimately to Jesus. See, God wanted to form Israel so that through them, salvation would not just come only to them, but that through them, the entire world would experience salvation, the life that only he can give. The tabernacle was one of those symbols of anticipation and a reminder that God is with us and that he can be with all of us. So when Jesus declared to his disciples in the New Testament in John chapter 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is, this is something that's hitting home for them. Because I imagine the disciples hearing Jesus say these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. They have to be thinking to themselves, is he saying what I think he's saying? And I, I, I racked my brain trying to think of a modern day example, and I couldn't think of one. But he is associating himself with this place of worship. Because this language was associated with the tabernacle, in this case, in point, with the temple. Immediately, they were transported there. Remember, Jesus is the fulfillment of the tabernacle, of the temple, the very indwelling presence of God. Jesus is God with us. So when they hear, hear these words, they see this image at some level of the temple, of the tabernacle. And they're realizing that the entrance the way in and the way out is called the way. The, that's what the gate is called. And then you have this inner chamber called the truth. You have to walk through the doorway of truth. But only the priests could go into that holy place where the threshold was truth. And then into that place, the holy of holies, you have the life. And it's the veil that was torn when Jesus was crucified. And that was referred to as the veil of life. This is what's going on in the disciples' minds when Jesus says these words. If you notice, there's a progression that we move through. And it's what we try to do in this series to give broad strokes of how do we move from the way, the truth, and into the life. Many of us stop at the way, but I think it's just the beginning. He wants more for us to be purified, sanctified in truth, and then that to experience the fullness of life that only he can offer. And we long within our souls for God to be with us. But God can't just be with us and us remain unchanged. His very presence will demand something of us. We may not like it, we may not understand it, but it will beckon us to change something within because he's calling us to a new way of life. And he's saying, I want you to lay some things aside. I want you to take some other things up. I want you to trust me with these things because as we read earlier in John chapter says, he says, I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. God wants us to experience fullness of life that only he can give. See, when Jesus shared these words with his disciples, the cross was still to come. We're on this side of the cross, but the cross was still to come. And we understand a little bit more than the disciples did right now. Because when Jesus says these words to his disciples, a story is still being written. We have the book now. But the people, remember, were anticipating 
the arrival of God in some fashion. And yet God in this moment is revealing something about himself. God has a way of taking the visible things in our lives to teach us invisible truths about himself. The temple was 100% a foreshadowing, foreshadowing of who he was and what was to come. The way God chose was a way for us. He says, enter into the truth and experience life. Here's the thing. The way that God chooses for us is a way that normally doesn't make sense to us. It's a way that doesn't make sense to the world. Because we have our own agendas. We have our own priorities, our own desires, our own hopes. And many of us come into the way and we want it to be true for us. And we think that if we get what we want, then somehow we'll experience the life. And we're just manipulating these terms to see how they serve us best. That's not what Christ calls us into at all. Because when you stop and look at the way of Christ, it's very different. In many ways, it goes against what we think is actually true. For instance, in God's way, if you want to be first, you have to be last. If you want to find yourself, you must lose yourself. If you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. If you want to see glory, then you got to suffer. If you want to go up, you got to go down. And if you want to live, you have to what? Die. It doesn't make sense. No, I'm good. I'm good. Whatever that is, I don't think I want that right now. But Jesus says, but if you trust me in this, you're going to experience the fullness of life that only I can give. And that's the way of the manger that leads to life. And Jesus understood that. See, it's very difficult to talk about, to fully talk about Jesus coming into our midst, arriving on the scene as a baby, and not talk about his death. Because Jesus was born to die so that you and I could live fully always and permanently, eternally with God. When we look at the tabernacle, the temple, this place of worship, yet this progression of sanctification that seems to be revealed to us. See, stepping into the way is only the beginning. So if you've walked into the way of Christ and say, that's it, you're selling yourself short, there's so much more to that. See, entering into the way is huge because that is where we realize Christ's sacrifice for us. And that's what happened in that outer court after you went in through the way. That's what happened there. You had different sacrifices taking place that only the priest could perform. And then after the sacrifices were offered up, some daily and and once a year, the priest got to do the Day of Atonement, a major sacrifice, a scapegoat. But these sacrifices weren't lasting. They weren't ultimate They had to be done over and over, pointing to something that was to come. They kept looking forward to something. But in that outer court, you would receive the sacrifice. The sacrifice was performed. There was the sprinkling of blood, the shedding of blood. Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there is no sacrifice. And then he would walk over to this basin and wash his hands. Some say this is pointing to this idea of baptism, that after we've received Christ's sacrifice, understanding ourselves to be bought by the blood of Christ, that then we, as obedience, we get baptized. But our lives don't stop there. We're then invited to live a life of holiness, set apart for God's purposes only. It's essentially what holiness means. And that's where we enter into the truth, and we worship, and we pray, and as we're entering into that space, God begins to do stuff in us that only he can do. Here's what's interesting, though. Once you go into that place, the truth, you got that veil of life that leads you into the holy of holies. And this is where God dealt with the sins of his people. But only the high priest was able to go into that space. The person had to be fully prepared before he went in there. If not, he would die instantly because he was in the very presence of dwelling presence of God. 
Now, the priest did all of this on behalf of the people. And in many ways, the priest served as a mediator, a bridge between humanity and God on behalf of everyone else. It's something they looked forward to. But yet they, were, they kept looking for something greater to come. Because even what the priest did wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient. It was pointing to what would come later. So on that first Christmas day long ago, Jesus was born to be our high priest. To be the ultimate bridge between us and God. And scripture says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. No one or anything else can do that. Not even your grandma, as good as she may be. But then has, this has implications for us. Because as a result of this, God then establishes a royal priesthood. That's where you and I come in. And I asked last week, how many of you see yourselves as priests? And I know what you're thinking, like, man, this is weird. We think that sometimes priests, people that are holier than thou, we look at the news now and we're like, nobody wants to be a priest. I get it. Or you have to wear a weird looking robe, looks like a dress. Like, yeah, that's not me, thank you very much. But it's about to function. And in many ways, it's returning back to the garden. It's what Adam and Eve were doing. They were cultivating. They were keeping. That's what the priest did. And now God gives these same words to us to carry this out. So biblically, the most important role of a priest was not to lord over peeps and to tell them what's right and wrong, but to be that place where heaven and earth meet, where there is a collision of life and death of peace and chaos and joy and sorrow. And we get to step into those spaces. This is where I believe we begin to experience the life that God has for us. Not just after we die, but here and now. And part of God's plan is to activate his people full of his spirit, full of his presence. Because not only are we anticipating something, but the world is also anticipating something. They just don't know what it is. But they have longings and cravings, hoping that something would change, that something would happen. And our great high priest came to show us the way to the fullness of life. Jesus is the son of man and the son of God. So he's able to do what only he could do because of who he is. But he says, now I want you to go and be a part of this. A priest mediates for others, advocates, stands in the gap. Sometimes it's not go and fix people's problems. That's not what a priest does. Is when I find out that my brother is suffering and I don't have means to help, my number one priority is to pray. Prayer is not our last resort. Prayer should be our primary resource. Our go-to is that we turn to prayer. Because we should be a people of faith saying, God, you know this situation, you can intervene, and I'm going to literally step in the gap with this person between where they are and their need. And God begins to move in that way. You're at work, you don't have to be all crazy about it. But simply in your heart, God begins to move in your heart and you start to pray. That is a priestly function. Because a priest serves before God, not human beings. So we begin to press into that. A priest creates spaces for people to encounter God here on earth. Some of you have that incredible gift of hospitality. Use it so that people can encounter God. We can gather for all sorts of things and everything else, and that's not bad. And when I say create a space, I don't mean that everything has to be a worship service and some guy playing in the background with music. That's not what I'm talking about. But that your office, maybe even your car, in your presence at a restaurant, at a teacher's lounge, wherever you may be, 
is a place for people to encounter God because you're going to pray with them. You're going to share a word of hope. You're going to share some encouragement with them. For that, you have to be in the word. The word's got to be in you because if not, you have nothing else to share. You're not it's just a reel of positive thinking for people. Hey, keep your head up. Let go, let God. This is not what I'm talking about. It's getting in with folks right where they are. That's what a priest did. What, we, what a priest does is we point people to Jesus. Hey, I don't have the answer right now. You're right, this is extremely difficult and confusing and dysfunctional. You're right, but I do know this. I know that God loves you. I know that God cares for you. And I know that God has a plan. Would you come with me? either to a Bible study, would you come here to church, or I got some friends coming over, we'd love to just pray for you real quick. You have no idea what that would do to someone's soul, to the trajectory of their life, because you chose to simply trust God with something that the world would say, that's so stupid. Don't waste your time. But some of you, as I'm speaking and I'm looking at you, you're bubbling up inside because God has been doing this in you. And he's pushing you to do even more. He's leading you to do more. The Spirit wants to guide us as priests in this world. Listen to what Hebrews 14, uh, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as you and I are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace, with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, because the veil of life was torn, now we have free access to God. We come to him in boldness, in confidence, in humility. So you have a need, go to God. You don't need to come to the pastor. You don't need to go anyone else. Yeah, it helps when you have somebody else, but we can go straight to God in our time of need. And Jesus made that possible. That is God with us. Even more so, he says, I want to reside in you. I want to live inside of you. And in this, the Spirit's work inside of it begins to change us from the inside out. Hebrews continues, and we like him, check this out, are called to the ministry of healing in the world as he leads us and teaches us his way. We got some learning to do. We have some teaching to do. Just like him, we are called to the ministry of healing in the world. This is life, y'all. Life unfolding, emerging in our midst. You and I get to be a part of that kind of ministry. Because priests don't live for themselves. We live for those we serve. That was God's plan for Israel and for the church. Priests mediate. They intercede. We stand in the gap for folks. We cultivate and we keep. We don't own anything. We steward what God's given us. We become that meeting place between God and the world as intercessors. And as the Father has sent his son Christ, Christ sends us into this world. Just as God sent Christ, he sends us. This is Christmas. This is Jesus being sent to us. And he says, in the same way, I will send you into this world. And y'all, we're going to arrive in places where they're expecting something, but they're not sure what they're expecting. But they're wanting some relief. There's pain, there's sorrow, there's dysfunction. And he says, I want you to be part of this ministry of healing in this world. And you're thinking, man, how do I show up? First thing, show up. It doesn't matter what you can say or do if you don't show up. Everything else will fall into place. Just show up. And things will begin to happen. In the beginning, I asked this question. 
What are you looking forward to? Not just in this season, but in life. Do you know? See, it's so easy to turn inward and simply focus on our needs and wants. That's our go-to. That's humanity. And as we experience the life that God wants for us, something deep within starts to shift. And suddenly I was looking forward to things to just make my life better and to comfort me, which is not a bad place to be. But I don't think we should stop there. Suddenly, I look forward to being utilized by God in a different way. What if that's what we looked forward to? God arrival in our lives so that we can arrive with God in someone's life. What would that look like? So that they too can experience the fullness of life that we've been blessed with. He says, I want to impart this gift. God, I want you to use me in the healing of this world. God may send you to some country in Africa, halfway around the world. He may ask you to send a text to walk across the street from where you live, across the hall. Many times these encounters that we long for don't happen the way that we think they ought to. But let me tell you, God has shown up. And I think he's telling, asking his people, will you show up? Let's pray. God, we thank you for showing up in our lives in the way you do so over and over. Lord, I pray that you would give us humility and strength and courage and understanding to live in to the reality of your truth. Lord, we want to go through the way, the truth, and experience the life you have for us. So may may we set aside anything. We give you all fear and apprehension. Lord, that you would use marriages right now to reach other folks that are hurting, that are in need. Lord, use us to be a part of this ministry of healing. I don't know how exactly it takes place for everybody, but you do. Because Lord, in that healing, we find life. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us the healing that we need and the life that we need. Use us as your body here on earth to create spaces for people to encounter you, the living God, especially during this Christmas season. In your name we pray and ask all of this. Amen. Please stand as we sing.
before you see the benediction, you should have received one of these on the way in. You don't have to RSVP. Somebody asked me, you don't, just show up. And that was a few years ago. But take one of these too to, to give to someone. It might be the first step in creating a space for someone to encounter God. If you're a Christ follower, you are a royal priest. You have been commissioned by God to create spaces for people to encounter him. And our faith kicks in because when we do that, that means we're not putting ourselves at the top of our priority list. We're trusting God to take care of our needs. And in as much as we do that, let me tell you, you will experience healing and so will this world. So go in his peace and in his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's people said,